Luke chapter 11 tonight. Would you go there with me? The Gospel of Luke, get chapter 11 opened up in front of you. And uh, we're going to take a look at a passage here tonight that I trust will be a challenge and encouragement and timely in all of our lives. You know, something that I, I personally sometimes feel very encouraged with is that Jesus repeated sermons. I don't know if you noticed that, but as you read through the four Gospels, you will read sometimes a message that he preached in Matthew and then turn around and read the same similar message in Luke or in John or even in Mark. And as you read through, you, 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 you see just a little bit of a word change and you're, you're recognizing, wait a minute, this is in a different location. Well, it's because the Lord was emphasizing something and was reteaching and re-preaching a message uh, to his true followers. You say, why is that encouraging? Because I often will re-preach and reteach something that has stirred my own heart. It's not something that I just say, yeah, I'll just pull this off the shelf and, and kick this out. These are messages that are burning in my heart. Sometimes a soloist will repeat a, a song that they've sung many times, or a choir will sing a song that they've sung before. And so it's helpful. Any good teacher will tell you the most important tool in teaching is repetition, repetition, repetition. Jesus practiced that. Well, we're going to read tonight here in Luke 11. I could have also read to you in Matthew 6. If you're familiar with Matthew 6, you know that you're right in the heart of the greatest sermon ever preached. The Sermon on the Mount, we call it. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. But it was in a different setting at that time. And Jesus used <clears throat> a little bit of different wording in Matthew 6. And it's a different study for a different time. But here in Luke 11, Jesus is in the midst of activity with his disciples. And he pauses and does something. And we don't know exactly where he is when this occurs and yet, as a result of the decision that Jesus made, the disciples asked for personal help. And I love that, because I don't know about you, but I'm constantly needing his help. What I'm about to read tonight is pretty familiar territory. The turf that your spiritual feet are going to walk on is familiar turf. But if you would symbolically take your spiritual sandals off and Feel the blades of grass under your, at your toes and each grain of sand with a newness and a freshness. And let the Spirit of God do some teaching in your life tonight that will be, I pray, timely and helpful. Let's start in verse 1 of Luke 11. It simply says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Isn't that interesting? He's talking about John the Baptist, the baptizer. Um, I think of John the Baptist, I think of uh, baptizing, I think of strange clothing. Uh, and in a stranger diet, when you read about what John did, you realize here that the disciples of Jesus realized that John's disciples were taught by him in the matter of prayer, about the matter of prayer. Now verse 2, this is Jesus speaking. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. 
For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me. Now don't miss this next phrase. And I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend. Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs, as much as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg... Will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Father, we pray that tonight you'll do that hidden work in our hearts that only you can do. Spirit of God, you be our teacher. Lord Jesus, as we read these words that you gave to the followers of your day and the followers of this day, may we recognize what you're trying to tell us. Now, Lord, help these, my friends, as they have to set aside thoughts of the busyness of the day and the activities to be done later on tonight and tomorrow, and help us to get locked in and lean into the mirror of God's Word and hear what we need to hear. We ask it in our wonderful Savior's name. Amen. There's a name of a man in church history past that uh, most of you would probably be familiar with. His name is George Mueller. Lived in the late uh, 1800s, died in 1888. Lived in Bristol, the Bristol area of London, England. It's a preacher. Interesting, I just found this out this afternoon. From the age of 70 to 87, those 17, 18 years, he traveled over 200,000 miles in ministry. You've got to think about the era of time in which he lived. Uh, that worldwide evangelistic outreach that he did was in a day in which they didn't have the traveling uh, abilities that we have today, and much of what he did was on board a ship. Most of the things that Mueller is known for is the fact that he opened up, he started five orphanages, and they were opened by a heartbeat of faith. He had over 10,000 orphans that were cared for through the years in those five orphanages. 3,000 of those orphans professed faith in Jesus Christ as a result of his ministry. I suppose my, maybe the most familiar story, and there are many, the most familiar story in the life of George Mueller is the time in which he got up one morning and his helpers, his assistants had set the table, they had put the plates out for breakfast, they put all the spoons and the cups and, the, and everything was in place, but there was literally no food, there was no milk, and there was no money to go out and buy food. They didn't have anything to feed the children in the orphanage. George Mueller approached the table and he said to the kids, he said, children, I know it's time for you to be in school. So then he lifted up his head and then he lifted his hand toward heaven and here's what he said. Dear Father, we thank thee for what you are going to give us to eat. Amen. And when he finished that prayer, a knock came on the door. Many of you know this story. He walked over and they opened up the door and there was a baker at the door. He said, Mr. Mueller, I can't explain it. I don't know why, but I couldn't sleep last night and I couldn't sleep at all. So I got up at two o'clock this morning. I was told by God to make the orphanage 
bread. So he said, I've been making bread all night long. And he said, and I got it here as fast as I could. Could you help me unload, get some folks to help me, and I'll give you all the bread that I made. As soon as they got all the bread in and Mueller thanked him appropriately, they closed the door. Another knock came to the door. They opened up the door. The milkman had just broken down his milk cart. Many of you remember milkmen used to deliver milk. He, uh, in the 1800s for sure, his milk cart had just broken down right out in front of the orphanage. And he said, I don't know if you have any need for milk, but he said, I got to get this milk off my cart. And I, can I give it to you and the orphans today? And that kind of experience happened to Mueller frequently. I suppose this evening that if I ask you for testimony of things that God has done in your life that couldn't be explained other than the fact that God just answered prayer, sometimes as a result of just a thought in your mind, I could turn this into quite a testimony meeting of people beginning to pray about God's miraculous touch. But I would like to ask you another question. How long has it been since you have been overwhelmed or overjoyed Here's a word that you hear all the time, but I mean it in the truest biblical sense. When was the last time you were blessed by what God did as a result of your prayer life? I know. I know. Anytime that I deal with the subject of prayer in my own life, or anytime I preach or teach or speak on the subject of prayer in, in counseling or in conversation, or if, I'm, if I preach on the subject matter, it is incredible to me how it is obvious that Satan does not want us to get this truth. He really doesn't. You enter into a new warfare when you start dealing with the subject of prayer. I mean, it's, it's as if the devil says, I'll, you, you churches, have your organizations. You churches, have your programs. Have them all, set up everything. Churches, have your curriculum. Churches, use all of the mechanical tools to help you be better orchestrated to put together everything you want to do. But please, don't start praying. Because I can't stop that. Because when you get God involved with what all you're doing with your programs and your organization and your curriculum, there's no stopping what God can do. So you enter into warfare. Could it be tonight that our prayer life really needs an overhaul? Could it be tonight that my prayer life and your prayer life needs a vibrant reworking? I'm convinced tonight that an awakened church and an awakened believer is a believer and is a church that has been awakened to the matter of genuine, significant, specific, steadfast prayer. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, everything in the Christian life is easier than prayer. He said, prayer is work and it always starts by people admitting, I am weak. And we refuse to really admit that we need help. Where in the world did we ever get to the point to where we stopped believing that we are needy people? Why is it sometimes it takes some particular state of desperation in our life where the proverbial rug is pulled out from under you that we tend to get at that point real serious in prayer? I think in some cases we're unenthusiastic about prayer. We, I think we just, we, we've lost the enthusiasm for it for, for various reasons. I don't know. Maybe there's just no particular state of desperation, as I said. You know, James said, he said, you have not because you ask not. In some cases it's not just uh, unenthusiasm, un it is unoffered prayer. We're just not even really praying. We're just saying kind of general words. I find it interesting in our passage here, if you'll notice in verse 2, the very first thing that Jesus said was this, when ye pray. I told you I almost preached, I looked at Matthew 6 this afternoon in preparation for tonight, and as I looked at it, I noticed that there were at least three times where Jesus referred to his people, and he says, now when you pray, as you pray, as you begin to pray, he, there's no question that tonight, that as a believer in the Lord, most of you, if not all of you, have probably had a season of prayer even today. 
But in some cases, our prayer life is so unspecified that we really don't know at the end of the day if God has answered our prayer or not. Because we've asked him to lead in our life, and we're not real sure what that really means, but we pray it. We ask God to bless the missionaries, and, and, and they thank you for that. But what do you mean by that specifically? We were given some specifics tonight. Sometimes we, we pray in such general ways that, again, at the end of the day, we're not, we don't live with a sense of expectancy during the day because we've not asked for anything or we've not spoken to the Lord about anything and expected an answer. Now, by the way, prayer is not just asking, although prayer does include that. We'll see it tonight. Sometimes it's unoffered prayer. Sometimes it's because of unconfessed sin. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, in other words, if I just let iniquity go on in my life unaddressed, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Gentlemen who are married, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible tells us as men, as husbands, to dwell with your wives with understanding as joint heirs in the grace of God. Isn't that a great statement? You are joint heirs of the grace of God. Then he says that your prayers will not be hindered. Sometimes our prayers are, are not answered and we don't see God do anything because we have unconfessed sin. And in some cases, it is because of an undisciplined life. You know, I don't know about you, but most of us wake up in the morning and we think of everything we got to do that day. You know, we're busy. We're busy. And, we, and, and if you get up on a typical morning, you get up and, you, and, and maybe you're, uh, you, you say, I've got to get some exercise in before I do it. You know, if I don't get it in now, I'm not going to get it in the rest of the day. So you, you get a little bit of exercise in. Then you've got to get that breakfast in. Then you get cleaned up. And, and, then, and as you start getting ready, as the clock just keeps ticking, you, you've got to get out the door. You, you stop and you, and you say, now, Lord, I just need to talk to you uh, for a moment. It's almost in this day and age of texting and emails, we almost do the same thing with God. Lord, just, I just need to tell you, I, need, I just need some, uh, I need you to help me with this and, and, and let the boss be out of town and, and uh, I, uh, let the kid finally pass geometry. Amen. You know, and, you, know you say, more that's a little far-fetched. I, I realize that, but the truth is sometimes we get so, so quick with our prayers, which by the way, there's a place for what, we would call, what I call rocket prayers. Nehemiah did it. Nehemiah would be talking to the king and all of a sudden the king said, what can I do for you? And Nehemiah said, so I pray to the Lord. And then he answered the king. Well, what does that mean? He just shot a prayer up to God. Lord, help me. Here we go. And he just got into it. So there's a place for that. Maybe tonight our prayer life needs some discipline. I suppose this last year I had a privilege that I'm going to miss most of all. In the midst of having a year of not being on the road. The only scheduled demands of my life this last year was the next doctor's appointment. And there were plenty. That was all I had to do. Every day I didn't have to watch the watch and when was the next time I preached and what, was, what were the scheduled demands. And honestly, the thing that I'm, I, I found most precious was being able to get up and when weather permitted and when my health permitted, I would take off for a walk and just walk around and watch the sun come up and, and talk to my God. And I have felt no rush. You say, preacher, I don't have that kind of schedule freedom. I understand. I don't either anymore, really. But somehow or another, I think in our lives, we need to look back at our lives and make sure that there is a discipline to our schedule that would include opportunities for us to spend sweet time with our Lord. And I suppose if there's anything else that discourages us and is in prayer is the fact that we have, we have unbelief. That is, we have asked the Lord for something, and we've asked and asked and asked, and it just seems like he's not going to answer our prayer. And so we just start thinking, well, you know, somebody else can get their prayers answered, but I just can't seem to get it. I just, you know, the Lord just doesn't seem to care about my burdens, and that's not true. Somebody, you've seen the little statement, and maybe you've got a little plaque at home, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it just says, prayer changes things. Let me tell you what prayer changes. It changes me. Prayer changes me. 
when I get down to the point where I recognize that there are, there's maybe a callousness in my life, when it comes to prayer. And I just kind of go through the routine. Or I get, I get confused about prayer. I only see prayer as one, one element of just, just, you know, just giving God a laundry list of things that I want from Him. And I forget what, what even Jesus gives in what we call the model prayer here. And sometimes I think maybe the biggest burden in my life is that we just get content with our prayer life because everything seems to be fine. The bills are paid, health is okay, kids are doing all right in school, got job security, there's enough in the retirement fund, everything's fine, and so we get kind of content with where we are until the Lord brings some situation of desperation. Can I just, can I just give you some examples in scriptures? There was a leper. The Bible says he was full of leprosy, Mark chapter 4. Full of leprosy meant he was eaten up with it. I would say he was desperate. And he comes to Jesus, and what does he say? He says, if you, if you will, you can make me whole. What was he saying? He goes, I know you can do it. The question is whether or not you will, and I'm asking you for healing. And the Lord, the Bible says, the Lord Jesus, I love this, he touched him. Now, most people ran from that guy, but Jesus touched him. He was full of leprosy. And he said, I will be thou clean. You see, a diseased woman who everybody else avoided because she, she had been sick of, the, of an internal bleeding disease for 12 years, and yet she reaches out in the crowd and touches the tassel on his garment, and she just reaches out. I mean, she wasn't allowed into the synagogue. People, she had to warn people that when she, she got near people that she had a disease so they could avoid her, and yet she came to Jesus, and Jesus turned and he calls her daughter. The only time he ever called a lady daughter, he meant, he meant you're now in the family, your faith has made you whole. Jairus, the synagogue leader, a well-known, wealthy man, everybody in the whole town of Capernaum knew him. When he saw Jesus, he was desperate because his 12-year-old daughter was dying. And he literally, this wealthy, well-educated, well-known man, falls down and worships Jesus. And he says, would you please come to my home? My daughter is dying. You know, we get desperate. We don't care what anybody else thinks about us. We, we don't care what, what the, 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 the pressure of the crowds. We seek Him out and we say, I need you. So, it must have been something special to hear Jesus pray. And I'm going to skim through some things here tonight. We don't have time to go through it all. I just ask you as we go through Luke 11 here and the teaching that Jesus gives us, would you just take a look at your own life? You say, preacher, I pray. Oh, I know that. Jesus said... He said, when you pray. But he was giving those disciples a little bit of a booster shot. He was giving them a recharge. Can I use the word? Revival. He was kind of renewing the passion. In fact, evidently when Jesus finished praying, it must have been so special to hear him pray that one of the disciples said to him, Lord, you got to teach us this thing about prayer. We think that, I think that I'm going I'm to preach better. I'm going to teach better. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better dad. I'm going to be a better follower of you if I can learn to pray like you pray. Teach us to pray. And so Jesus said, all right, come up close, boys, and let me tell you, when you pray, say this. And the first thing he gives us, folks, I'm going to just simply skim the surface with you. You can dig on your own into further study, but here's the first thing I see. He gives us the person of prayer. The person of prayer. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, when you pray, say, our Father. You say, Morris, I know this model prayer. I've said it my, all my life. By the way, it is a very special prayer. It really is. Very, very important words are said here. But stop with the first two words. Our Father. You say, Morris, I got it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yeah, there's a great deal of worship. There's a great deal of reverence. And I, I think that's a healthy practice to start your prayer off by saying, oh God, you are worthy of my worship. And oh God, thank you for who you are and for what you, and all that I'm learning about you. And to adore him. I think that's, that's priceless. So important. But just stop with the first two words. Our Father. Can I say something parenthetically here? Yet emphatically at the same time. I never noticed this until this afternoon. He says, our 
father. I think that there's something that Jesus is saying. He is saying he's my father and he's your father. This is a family prayer. And he's saying, I'm going to be with you in this prayer. Jesus intercedes for us. The Bible tells us in Romans 8 that he is ever at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. So he says, he's our Father, so when you pray, I'm right there with you. But I also believe as a church family, there is a place for corporate prayer. There is a place for praying together. There's a place for you to pray with other believers in a prayer meeting time and to pray with your family. And there's a place for, for working together in prayer. But there's also certainly, he says, when you pray. So there's a place for private prayer. Here's the point. He says, remember the person of prayer. Who is he? He's my father. In fact, it was Jesus who introduces God as our Abba, Father. Now, I'm going to say this as quickly as I can, but you've got to understand the culture that these disciples were in. Please put yourself in their sandals for a moment. They had been taught the Old Testament world of who God was. There was a righteous reverence for Almighty El Shaddai, God, Almighty God. Absolutely. In the Old Testament, he's known as the Lord of hosts, the God of armies, the armies of angels, the Lord of hosts, of all the stars and the galaxies above, the Lord of it all. He's known as the Creator, the one who spoke and all things came to be. In five words, the Bible says, and he made the stars also. Go out on a starlight night, starlit night, and just look in the sky and just realize the Bible just says in five words all that you see. And he made the stars also. It's almost like uh, and also he made the stars. You talk about power. In the Old Testament, the world that these disciples knew, this almighty God, he was never called Father in the Old Testament except less than five times. Less than five times. Not that he wasn't the father of, the, of, of Israel, but he was not referred to as that. But when you turn after the 400 years between the Old and New Testament, you come to the Gospels, Hannah Whitehall Smith revealed something that is fascinating to me. She said in one of her books, she said, It was Jesus who introduced to us God as our Father. She said he referred to God the Father 167 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In other words, he was trying to emphasize that this almighty God who spoke and was all-powerful and all-knowing, by the way, he's your father. He's your father. So what does that mean? Well, it means you recognize his nature. What is his nature? A caring, loving father. Now, maybe you did not have a good relationship with your earthly dad, and so there's kind of a disconnect here. There's not a real warmth in your heart about the idea about God being your father. This is the father who never loses his temper. This is the father who's never out of town. This is a father who never says, go ask your mother, I don't have time. This is a father who never slaps his children around. This is the father you've always wanted. Jesus says he is your Abba. Father, in that little Israeli world, that term Abba, which uh, Jonathan can tell you, they, and many of you have been to Israel, they, the children there still use that term, Abba. It's the most intimate term. It's like Papa, Daddy. We here in America get our children to say Daddy. And the little babies go, Dad, 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 Dad. You know, and the dad says, Yep, yeah. The first word my kid ever said was daddy. No, no. He, first word he ever said was mommy. You say, no, it was daddy. No, it was mommy. It didn't, it didn't come out with mommy. It came out more like, ah, that's mommy. All right, that's what that means right there. I'm hungry. Get in here and take care of me. We teach American babies to say, dad, 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 dad. And a loving father responds to that. But in that Israel, Hebrew culture, the term is Abba. And Jesus is telling us that this mighty Father is our Abba. So, when you recognize His nature, you can rest 
in his nurture. You can come up close like a child does to a loving father, knowing this father loves me and takes me just as I am and cares for me and wants to be near me. That's why Jesus constantly was making statements. He said, your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. He's your father. He said in Matthew 7 and verse 11, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask? The fact is in Romans 8, we are told that as many as are led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have, you have received the spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father. And you come to Him with a sense of, of peace. There's no room for worry with a loving Father. He's my Father. He cares for me if one of my sons calls if my phone rings, I look down and I see that one of my sons is calling. No matter what I'm doing, my world stops. And I answer the phone. Now, if, it's, if I'm in the midst of studying or if I'm in the midst of doing something that I'm involved with and if I get a phone call I don't recognize or something, I will often let it go to my voice message. Now, you understand, if you ever call me, I wouldn't do that to you. But I'm talking about all those other people. Uh, I may let it go to a voice message, but when my son calls... I'm stopping what I'm doing. And I'm answering the phone. And when I hear a, an occasional, not often, but if I hear an occasional serious tone on the other end, hey, Dad, just need to talk to you for a moment. Oh, yes, yeah, son. And all the time in the world. What have you got? Why? Because I'm a dad. I'm a father, and I want, to, I want my sons to know I'm here for you. Sometimes, most of the time I hear, Dad, did you see that game last night? And I go, no, I was in church. Where were you? And oh, I, I'm in church every night of my life. So when you recognize his nature, he's a father. You can rest in his nurture. Now, I'm stretching a little bit, but you'll get the point. Then, therefore, you can request with nerve. You can be bold in your prayer life. When you get to know God as your Father, you can go anytime, any place, and ask of your Father for help. Do you remember? Uh, I'm going to date myself, and young people just, uh, I, oh boy, I'm going to sound like a dinosaur here. But uh, I, in the 1980s, okay, a long time ago, when when uh, men, never mind, I mean, a long time ago, banks. If you ever needed money from the bank, you, you, had, to, you had to go there when, the, when, the, when they were open, fill out a withdrawal slip, or maybe actually write a check out and take it up to a teller and have them uh, you know, give you the cash that was right out of your banking account. But somewhere in the early 1980s, they came up with these machines, ATMs. And I remember the church staff that I was on the, the business manager, uh, he, he said, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, I think those machines are kind of scary. I think it's, it's the mark of the beast. I think that it could, it could be something, that, you know. And I listened to him, and I thought, well, he probably knows, you know. So maybe, so I avoided those ATMs. You know, after a while, I got over his fear. And I got over there, and I realized, man, all I got to do is stick that card in there. And as long as I got cash, and sometimes when I didn't, I could get cash right out of that bank. And I, anytime, middle of the night, didn't care if the bank was closed. It was accessible. You know what the Father is saying to me and to you? He's saying, I, you know, you don't have to just pray when, when things are falling apart. You don't have to just pray when you're at church. You don't just pray in the morning and at night. I am always available. I'm always accessible. And I want to hear from you. And so I'm going to ask you again, my friend, how long has it been since you've seen God do something that only He can do? That we would call miraculous. It, it's, it's not miraculous so much to him because he's God, but he is your father. And the first thing Jesus says is this. He goes, recognize the person of prayer. He's your father. I was talking to some friends last night about a camp ministry that we got to be a part of years ago. For five years, I was the camp director of a camp called the West Branch of the Bill Rice Ranch in Flagstaff, Arizona. We had some wonderful memories. We, we helped, helped the camp. It was just getting started. It was kind of a church, it was like, a, like a church plant. It was a camp plant. 
And uh, so, man, we were just constantly thrilled for any campers to come. Our very first week of camp was for junior boys and girls. You know what that age group is? That's like 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. Now, I love, I love teenagers because, honestly, I've said this for years, you can herd teenagers. Did you know that? You can say, young people, let's all go to the ball field. They all want to go there. Let's all go to the dining room. They want to be together. But with juniors, it's juniors, get off the roof, would you? I mean, you know, and put the knife down and, you know, and I mean, uh, juniors are a whole new world. But anyway, our very first week of camp was with these junior boys and girls. Early in the week, I preached a message, and I have no idea what text I used, but I preached on the subject of prayer very briefly in a morning chapel. And I said to the boys and girls, I said, boys and girls, God answers your prayers too. You don't have to be a camp director to get your prayers answered. You don't have to be your pastor just to, to, to get your prayers answered. You don't have to be your dad and mom. You can get your prayers answered if you know Jesus. Well, there was a little girl there by the name of Abby. And Abby walked into our, um, our, our uh, craft shop that we had there. And she saw something. Many of the crafts that we had were free that you could just get and make something. But some things had to be purchased. They were a small price. And she saw something that she really wanted to make for her mom. It cost two dollars. That little junior girl looked in her little, you know, little coin purse and she didn't have two dollars left. And she remembered what Mr. Gleiser said in that message. Jesus answers my prayers too. So she said, God, I'm not going to talk to anybody else but you about this. I want you to give me $2 because I really want that, that craft shop item. She goes, I, I'm not going to tell my counselor. I'm not going to tell anybody from my church. I'm not going to tell Mr. Gleiser. I'm just asking you, give me $2. You've got to remember, she's at camp. I mean, you know, where's money going to come from? It's not, going to, it's not available. But she's, she just said God answers prayer. There was no tree that was out there. You know, every parent says, you know, we don't have money growing on trees. If we did, I would have plucked it clean. I guarantee you, try to keep that camp going. It was Friday morning, the last day of camp. We were eating breakfast. One of our staff members got up and he said, well, we got a bunch of mail that has arrived, and some for staff and some for campers. He began to call out names and pass out mail, and he called the name Abby. He gave her full name. Had a little card there from her mother. The little card simply, as she opened it up, said, Abby, I sure miss you. Can't wait for you to get home. I can't wait to hear what a good time you've had at camp this week. She said, I just thought you might like to have a little extra help. And inside that card was two $1 bills. Abby came from breakfast and came right over to the, our, our auditorium where I was getting ready for the service. And she walked up and she told me the story I just told you. That little nine-year-old girl said, look, she opened up that card. You were right. And I said, Abby, God is right. He's the one who showed you his power today. Oh, you say, preacher, two dollars. Okay, what are you living without today? What was the last time you saw that $2 looked like $2,000 to that little girl? And I'm not just talking about money tonight. I'm talking about watching what God and God alone can do. Abraham's servant sat down at a well far from home. He'd been sent to find a bride for, for Isaac. And he said, Lord God of my father Abraham. He knew who he was talking to. He goes, I... I've been sent here to find a bride for Isaac. And he goes, I don't know who I'm going to find. He said, just if you'll bring a, a, a lady to this well that will give me some water and to the camels. And he finished his prayer. He was specific. When he finished praying, he looked up and there was Rebecca. He didn't know her. He said, can I have some water? Sure, I'll give you. And hey, by the way, I'll give some water to your camels. Well, that must have taken a while. And the Bible says that servant stood, sat there and watched and he thought, my God did this. Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night long, praying with the Lord, please don't let my brother Esau hurt me tomorrow. And the next day as Esau, his brother showed up and threw his arms around Jacob and said, welcome home. 
Moses prayed and the sea parted. Hannah prayed so much that <clears throat> somebody thought she might be drunk. And soon after, she had her prayer answered by giving birth to Samuel. David prayed. And his enemy, by the name of Ahithophel, who had been threatening to harm David through Absalom, God answered David's prayer and Ahithophel went home and took his own life. Daniel prayed. And he was able to interpret King Darius's dream. Daniel prayed when he was in the, 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 the den of many lions. Elijah prayed and no rain came for over three years. Can you imagine that experience? He just said, I've prayed, it's not going to happen. I can imagine people in that kingdom thought, that guy's crazy. I imagine the king said, <laughs> Elijah, uh, out here praying that, that it's not going to rain for three years. This is hilarious. And all the servants gave the obligatory laugh. <laughs> yeah, 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 that crazy guy. You know, a month passed. The king said, hey, it's still not raining. And everybody's going, yeah, yeah, it's still not raining. Elijah, he says he believes that God can answer his prayer. Two months passed. Three months passed. It's kind of getting a little scary around there. And one little servant walks in. He goes, <laughs> it's still not raining. <laughs> <coughs> Three and a half years. No rain. And then finally Elijah got on his knees or got up on, on a mountain and bent his head over. And he said, God, send rain. Send it in a mighty torrent. He sent his servant up to the hillside. He said, check and see what's happening in the western sky. He came back and he said, nothing's happening, master. And Elijah kept praying, oh God, please send the rain. Send him a second time, a third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. Elijah could have gotten discouraged and said, oh, well, it's just not going to happen. Seventh time, he just kept on praying. He said, go back and check again. And the servant came back and he said, well, there's a little dark cloud. It's about the size of a man's fist. And he, Elijah said, pack it up, boys. He says, a torrent is coming. We're about to get a gully washer. And before he could get off that mountain, it had come. Jonah prayed. Wouldn't have you? In the belly of some giant fish? I would have gotten real serious about praying. And God gave him another chance. The person of prayer. He's your father. Quickly, number two. Jesus tells a story. I love this. I love the fact that Jesus told stories to make a truth clear. And I love his story. He tells a story of a man traveling from point A to point B, whatever it is. It was a common occurrence. People travel by foot or by some slow animal. And they usually travel in the cool of the evening because of the hot, humid, difficult weather sometimes. And so this man was traveling, and as he travels, he comes to some town, and he, he goes, and the, it, it, the Bible says it was midnight, which means the middle of the night. I don't know that anybody knew, hey, it's 12 midnight. They just came, and, and, and knocked. On, he knocked on a friend's door, and he goes, hey, friend, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to such and such. He says, I need a place to sleep. Now, it was, it was, uh, it was the ultimate responsibility of a faithful Jew you to open up your home and provide a place to sleep and to provide a meal so he brings him in and gets him ready and he goes over to check to see what can he feed him you got to understand these people didn't store up food like you and I do today they didn't have refrigeration they didn't have the money to have a bunch of food in storage and and the Bible says Jesus says that the man said I have nothing okay I've been there I don't mean in a cupboard to not have anything. I'm talking about in life. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. I'm at the end of my rope. I am desperate. Have you ever been there? That's where the man is. He's desperate. I have nothing. There was no 24-hour Walmart. There was no grocery store open all night long. There was no market that was available. It was the middle of the night, Jesus says. So what could he do? The only thing he could do was to go to another neighbor's house. That he assumed had something to eat and he goes over and possibly the man is, he and his family are sleeping up on the roof, a flat roof. Or maybe, maybe they're in, in some room where the window has been opened up but, and all of a sudden the man uh, knocks on that neighbor's door and he goes, Neighbor! Hey, neighbor! Neighbor! Maybe the man looks out the window and he goes, What? What do you want, man? 
He's rubbing his eyes. He's, he just woke up. He goes, well, what do you need? He goes, hey, hey, neighbor. He goes, hey, I got a friend over here that just showed up in my house. I don't have anything to feed him. I, I need three sandwiches. Now, the Bible says he asked for three loaves. You understand, don't you? He wasn't asking for a true loaf of bread. He was, he was asking for some bread and with maybe some... Maybe some kind of gravy or some kind of a meat if they had it possibly available of some sort. He was asking for some, some sandwiches. I need three sandwiches. And the, and the neighbor inside the house said, no, no. <laughs> and, and the man outside said, yes, I need three sandwiches. <laughs> and he said, get lost. And he goes, I don't have anything to give him. I need three sandwiches. And I told you to get off my property. I, I heard you. I need three sandwiches. Come back in the morning. Nope, got to have it right now. I need three sandwiches. Look, man, my, my family's with me in bed. And that was the truth. That's how they slept. I mean, they all slept in one. They didn't have large houses with multiple rooms. They were all in one room. Mom, dad, the children. Sometimes grandma and grandpa lived with them. And maybe if a servant, they were all in the same room. Man, are we glad that things have changed through the years and you get your own room. But I mean, they're all in there. And he says, you're waking up the baby. Uh-oh, you just woke up mama. And when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's where that was invented, right there in that story. I, I believe that's where it happened. <laughs> and the neighbor said, I'm so sorry to have to wake everybody up. I know it's not a good time. I know it's not. I know, I know, I know it's uncomfortable, but I need three sandwiches. Got to have it. And the man says, I'm going to close the curtain, and you're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block up this window. You can do so, but I'm going to keep knocking. I'm just going to keep knocking until you come. Would you look at verse 8 with me once again? Look at what Jesus said. He says in verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise in giving because he's his friend. In other words, he, he's not going to do it because they're good buddies anymore. Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. What's he saying there? The word importunity is in a unique word, okay? It's a word that means to be utterly, urgently troublesome. It's a word that means to be overly persistent. It means to be an annoyance. And don't look at anybody when I say that word, but it means to be an annoyance. Have you ever had a child, boys and girls, don't ever do this to your parents. Have you ever had a kid come up to you and, you know, a man's out here in the hallway, he's talking about, uh, he's talking about some deer he saw in the woods or something like that. And he's telling, he's telling this big story or some fish that got away or something like that. And he's telling this story and all of a sudden this little kid goes, daddy, 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 daddy. Daddy, 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 and finally the dad goes, what? Now, the dad's out of line for losing it, but the little kid needs to be taught how to approach his parents. Both are wrong, and that's exactly what Jesus tells us to do. I would feel guilty any other way of saying it, but that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Because of his annoying, urgent, over-persistence, he finally gets up and gives him all that he wants. So what's the point? Number one, we see the person of prayer. Number two, we see persistence in prayer. Oh, Morris, I've been asking God for something for a long time. Keep on praying. Keep on knocking. But I'm getting discouraged. Keep on asking. Verse 9, Jesus said, and it says there as he keeps talking, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be, future tense, given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. For every one that asketh, you've got to understand that word asketh is written in the tense and the mood that tells us it means ask and keeps on asking, receives and keeps on receiving. He that seeks and keeps on seeking, finds and keeps on finding. To him that knocks and keeps on knocking, it shall be opened. May I say to you that there are two words for the word knock. There is, the, there is the continual, just regular knock, and then there's that loud rapping of just pounding on the door. That's not the word that's used here. It's just the idea of continual asking, of continual. By the way, why is there knocking being used in this analogy? Because there's a door. You say, what's the point? The door is closed. And there are times in my life when I feel like the door is closed. You go read the Psalms and you'll read the psalmist say, Lord, where are you? 
Don't turn away from me. The Lord hasn't turned away, but he makes it appear that there are times in which we have to wait and keep on asking and knocking. You know, God knows the right time. We don't. God knows the right time to answer our prayers. We do not. Hear me. What family has not ever had a child come up, you know, and you ask your, your son or your daughter what they want for Christmas and you know, when they're a little youngster. and You know, some little kid says, Daddy, I, I really want this football for Christmas. Or, Daddy, I really want this football. I want this uniform, you know, with the star on the helmet. That's what I want. I, I want this uniform. Get it for that kid. He needs it. Uh, uh, he, uh, 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 mommy and Daddy, I want skates for Christmas. I really do. And, you know, every parent seems to say the same thing. You know, uh, it's not going to be that big of a Christmas this year. We, uh, we're just not going to be able to do what we usually do. And, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and all that stuff. And uh, we're just not going to be able to get everything that you really want. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, I just, I just want a bicycle. I really want those skates. I really want the uniform. Daddy, please. You know, it's, it's early November. And you go out the next day and find it because you're afraid they're going to run out. You find it, you buy it, you bring it home, get it wrapped, and what do you do? You put it up in the top part of the closet and hide it somewhere away. It's, it's November, long way from Christmas. And the whole rest of November and much of December, that kid keeps reminding you, Daddy, don't forget, I really, I really want that gift. I really want this item. Daddy, I really want it. And he, you just keep saying the same thing. I, I just don't think we're not going to be able to do much this year, son. What he doesn't know is he's already got it. It's just not time yet. Sometimes we pray, oh God, I really want this. I really need this help. I, Father, this circumstance at work is really getting bad. Would you please deliver me? Lord, this son of mine is away from you, and I'm begging you to please bring him back to you. Oh God, please save my spouse. She needs to be saved. He needs to be saved. Oh God, I'm asking you for this stress to be off of me. And the Lord says, you've already got it. It's just not time yet. Why does God make us wait? I think we learn a lot about our God during those times of waiting. And we learn a lot about ourselves. I repeat, prayer changes me. It changes you. We see the person of prayer. We see persistence in prayer. God's delays are not always God's denials. He is waiting for the right time. And sometimes our faith needs resistance to make it even stronger. Can you think of things you've stopped praying for tonight? Can you think of people that you, you don't pray for much anymore? Can you think of things or items or people that you really have never prayed for? Because honestly, you've just gotten to the point where you feel like, ah, it's not going to happen. The neighbor, Jesus says, comes and he says, I have nothing. I need your help. That's the position to be in. And there's one more thing. Jesus closes out by saying in verse, in verse 11, he said, If a son of you shall ask bread of any of that's a father, will instead of the, the bread, will he give him a stone? Stones in Israel sometimes look like fresh baked bread. Or if he asks for a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? You know, probably an eel that looks maybe like a fish, but it's a serpent. Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, meaning you're, you're a sinner, if you know how to give good gifts unto your children, I love this next phrase, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? May I just close by saying this quickly. We learn here not only the person of prayer, not only persistence in prayer, but we see provisions from the God of prayer. He provides. Okay, I'm just telling you, I'm just the delivery boy. This is what Jesus said. He says, if a, if a boy comes up to his dad and he goes, I'm hungry and I'm weak, I, I'm, I need help, I need bread, is he going to give him something that's going to hurt him? No. I, I'm, I'm weak. I need protein. I need, I, need to, I need to fish. I need meat. Is he going to give him a serpent that could harm him and make a joke out of it? Or give him something that he didn't ask for? No. 
He says, well, if you as a loving, caring father, though you're a sinner by nature, you give your son what he needs and you provide for him the physical strength that he needs, you provide what he has asked for, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give in Matthew, he said, give good things unto them that ask. And here he says, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Now stay with the truth. Jesus is saying this. Your Father will provide if you will just ask. He'll provide what? What you need. He will give you what you need. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us to know. You need wisdom? No, no, need, you need help to know what to do about your job. You need wisdom to raise your kids. You need wisdom uh, to teach your Sunday school class. You need wisdom. God says, just ask for it. I, I've got it for you. You need, you need fresh power to be a more effective witness for me. He says, J just ask, and I'll give it to you. You know, when you turn to the book of Acts, and you read of those, those first churches, friends, they didn't have microphones they didn't have comfortable seating, probably. They, they didn't have heat or air conditioning. They didn't have good lights. We know all that. But yet, as you read through the book of Acts in those early churches, you see that those people did so much with so little. In this generation, we seem to do so little with so much. I think it's because we depend upon our education. We depend upon our creative uh, juices and abilities and our skill sets and our personalities and our money and our, our, our organization. And there's a place for the education. There's a place for the money. And there's a place for, for the uh, curriculum. And there's a place for all that. But they'll only go so far. But when you cry out, Oh God, I have nothing to give people. I have nothing to help my family. I have nothing to help my church. I have nothing to win this world. God, give me bread so I can feed others. The Lord says, I've been waiting for you to ask. And I'll give you what you need. Provisions. From the God of prayer. Prayer helps us to remove all delusions of self-sufficiency. It makes us realize that we are deeply needy. And prayer reminds us that we will never be what we really need to be or do what we're supposed to do without divine anointing. Moses said to God in Exodus 33, you can send an angel all you want to, God, but we're not going without you. Remember that? God said, I'm just going to send an angel and let him to take you to the promised land. He goes, no, no, no. I'm not going without you. I've got to have you. Elisha was asked, what do you want, son? By Elijah. And he said, that power that you know, Elijah, I want a double portion of it. We only have so many hours on this earth to live. I'm going to tell you something. Some of us in this room have realized the shortness of life. I don't want to waste a moment. I don't want to waste an hour. I don't want to waste a day. And I want the power and freshness of God's presence in my life. And I pray you do too. Jesus said, so when you pray... Ask the Father to give you what you need. And I don't mean just the financial help, though it includes that. Not just for good health, though it includes that. He's talking here about the hand of God to help you fulfill the plan of God. To give bread to people in need. Walter Wilson, a medical doctor, died in 1969. A medical doctor, but he was a he was a preacher at times. He filled pulpits. He wrote books. He had a radio program telling people lessons that he had learned from the Bible. He was a very unique and gifted man. But Walter Wilson, for the most part, was a man who literally lived every day of his life practicing what Jesus is teaching right here. And he spent every day, he always said the same thing any minute. He said, God, I am your tool. Please put your hand upon me. Put me in contact with people who need you. He was in New York City 
He looked out one day outside of his hotel room and he saw the crowds of people, whatever borough he was in, and he said, Father, surely somebody out there is looking for answers and looking for hope and eternal life. I could never find them. It would be like finding the needle in a haystack. He said, Father, lead me to somebody out there that needs you. I'm your tool. Put your hand on me and guide me. He left his room, began to walk down the street, wherever he was in New York City. He walked by a, um, a card shop, a, uh, an office supply type store, and he saw in the window a leather-bound notebook, and it looked like a real quality one. It was the month of January, and he thought, I need to get a new journal for this year. And in that journal, he would write down, page after page, his prayer request. He would always write out his prayer request, and when God answered him, he would write off to the side how God did it and when God answered the prayer. He had page after page, year after year of answers to prayer. He says, I need to get a new journal. He stepped inside to an empty store, no customers, not even a clerk. And he stood around and he waited till finally from, back, from the back storeroom walked out the, the owner, the manager. And he, he came walking over to this man who's entered into his store, Walter Wilson. And he, he said, sir, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know I had a customer. What can I do for you? And he said, Walter Wilson said, I need to see that notebook in the window, that leather notebook. And they grabbed it and pulled it up. He opened it up and saw nothing but blank pages in it. And he said, this is perfect. He's thinking, I can write down all my prayer requests on these blank pages. He goes, I'll take it. They walked up to the cash register, and as the man was ringing him up and sacking it up, Walter Wilson, in his own words, said, I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit saying to me, do you remember what you just prayed back in the room? So he said, sir, do you know what I'm going to do with that notebook? And the clerk, the manager said, no, sir, I don't know what you're going to do. You can do whatever you want to with it. He said, that's going to be my prayer book. Well, the clerk was frustrated. And he goes, oh, sir, I don't sell prayer books here. You're in the wrong store. He was thinking of some religious book that somebody would write out, some type of poetic writing that appears to sound like words to God. He pulled that notebook out of the packaging to, to go put it back and and Mr. Wilson, Dr. Wilson said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I don't need somebody else to write out my prayers. I know how to talk to God myself. And with that, the manager came around the counter. He grabbed Mr. Dr. Wilson by the lapels, a stranger. He took him by the lapels of his coat. And he said, are you telling me that you know how to talk to God? You, you're in touch with God? He said, yes, I've been talking to him this morning. He said, Mr., before you walked into my store, I was in my back storeroom wringing my hands, asking, is there really a God? He said, I have been looking in church after church after church in New York City. And he says, as from, from everything I can see, nobody here knows God. He said, can you introduce me to God? I'm in desperate need. He said, that's why I'm here. He opened up his Bible and showed that manager the way to the Savior. Why? Because just earlier he said, I'm your tool. Put your hand on me. Lead me to somebody who's looking for you. And Dr. Wilson told story after story of that happening because he practiced what Jesus is teaching. The provision of power, the provision of wisdom, the provision of God's presence. How's your prayer life tonight? Does it need a wake-up call? Oh, you say, I'm doing fine. Everything's going good. Are you going to have to wait till something gets desperate before we recognize our God wants us to get serious about talking to our Father and asking for fresh bread to give to others? And sometimes we have to wait and ask for His power to do what he's called us to do. Would you bow with